This is Larry Jordan, the host of the Digital Production Buzz. The following interview is an excerpt from a recent program. To hear the entire program, visit digitalproductionbuzz.com. Maxime Yego is a film director, a screenwriter, and an author who splits his time between filmmaking and speaking as a futurist. He's a regular speaker at media technology conferences, film festivals, and events celebrating creativity. He's also the chief innovation officer at filmdo.com and a mentor to new filmmakers. Hello, Maxim. Welcome back. Hello. How are you? Good Hello. To see you. It's good to hear your voice. You know, the last time we chatted was um, in October, talking about your James Bond spoof. But <laughs> this time I, wanna, I want you to put your futurist hat on and share your thoughts on the trend toward ever higher resolution video. Mm. 4K is well entrenched in production. It's moving quickly into the consumer market. But is it likely to be successful? Well, it's, it's an interesting question, you know, that, that ultimately our job is to produce media for people to experience. And we're finding that most people can't tell the difference with a, a, a 4K screen compared to HD. Now, they can really, obviously, if it's SD. And so the the TV manufacturers are trying to produce um, uh, the marketing campaign, you know, that 4K is better, it's more pixels. But I was doing a little bit of the calculation and um, actually at a, enough of a distance from a screen, the the picture is effectively retina anyway, you know. And this, this idea of retina is that um, you can't see individual pixels, right? So it's as high resolution as your eye can perceive. And this was a thing that Apple made a big fuss about when they came out with the retina screen for the iPhone. And now that's become a kind of a standard that we refer to. But I, I think that a lot of people are just going to skip 4K. HD is great. There's not that much 4K material available. But what I'm estimating is that that we will, simply because we can, go for higher and higher resolution screens. If you look at frame rate, a lot of productions now, people are just shooting, they're overcranking at double frame rate because they can. It's extra data, but it just means you've got the potential to do slow-mo and, and you've got that flexibility in post. I'm seeing a lot of people shooting 4K, but they're not finishing in 4K at all. They're, they're finishing and grading and working on their content in 2K or, or 1080, really, HD. But I've, uh, I have this theory that we will inevitably go for higher and higher resolution screens because the technology is there. But I think that we will top out in terms of distribution at 8K. And the reason I think we're going to top out at that level is that uh, I worked out at a, if you had a 20 foot wide screen, which is as big as any front room I can imagine anybody having a TV on, at nine feet away, if you were working in 8K, it's retina. So even if you could go higher than that resolution, it would be fundamentally pointless. And really, well, Wait, 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 wait. Stop a second. In order for us to perceive an 8K image, it yeah. has to be viewed on a 20-foot screen. Oh, no, no, no. I'm just saying that, uh, no, of course, you can view it on anything, but it's pointless unless your nose is almost on the screen. Because, you know, the further away you are from the screen, the smaller the dots appear. So, or, at, uh, or wait, 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 I disagree with that. You're absolutely uh -huh. right. The further you get from the screen, the smaller the dots appear or the smaller the screen. Right. So if yeah. you were looking at an 8K image on a six foot screen, are you going to see 8K? No. I mean, you, you, can't, you can't perceive that image resolution. That's the point. So, you know, if you had a, a six foot screen, I didn't do the calculation for six feet, but uh, goodness, I mean, if the answer is the answer's enough, two and a half, two and, and a half feet, two and a half feet away from the screen to see 8K resolution. R th thank you. There you go. So uh, that sounds about right if it's nine foot at 20 feet. Uh -oh. So if you are uh, if you are pushing for higher and higher resolution media, then uh, it's pointless. For acquisition, maybe if you're doing scientific work or if you're producing, you know, Ari um, came out with a 65 mil frame sensor for, and then they, you know, they produce this extremely high resolution, high megapixel film camera, video camera. And then when they were asked what's it for, they had to say, well, we don't know, but we thought you know, something would be useful. <laughs> so I think that, you know, we're always going to push for, for a better and better acquisition. We want to accurately reproduce what's there. They humanize much better than cameras currently for perceiving real life. 
But in terms of distribution, NHK in Japan are now trialing an 8K 100 meg megabit AVC intro broadcast through satellite just to see if they can. It's an enormous amount of data to put in, in the satellite bandwidth to distribute at that resolution. My point is that I, I think we will go for higher and higher resolution screens, but there is a biological limit to how high it's worth going. And if you just said on a six foot screen, it's two and a half feet, it's, it's literally pointless to broadcast anything higher than that, even if we could. And what I think is interesting about that is that we're reaching new limits in our technology that are not defined by the technology, but actually by our own biology. We're very unlikely to have bigger walls in our lounges. We're very unlikely to have bigger screens. So there's, we're reaching a, a new threshold, a new limit, which I think is really interesting. What's much more interesting for the end user experience, I think, is uh, HDR, you know, broader color gamuts, that kind of stuff. See, that's what I want to get to. I don't think once uh, consumers see an HDR picture or a wider color gamut picture, they're going to be interested in resolution. They're going to I be agree. interested in the vibrancy and the, the emulation of real life that HDR provides that, that standard dynamic range can't begin to touch. And in fact, SD starts to look really good if you're looking at an HDR picture in a way that it never did when compared to HD. The difference between HD and HDR is just unbelievably toward HDR. Would you agree? I, well, I 100% agree. In fact, you know, I'm, I, as you know, I'm, I'm really into the VR headset thing and I, and I think that's going to be a huge new medium. But you're not always going to want to uh, put a headset on to watch the news or to see something in passing on a screen. Those are going to be a particular type of experience. I think that uh, somebody said something interesting about HDR that it hadn't occurred to me before, which is just for frame of reference for people who aren't familiar with this high dynamic range uh, idea, most TVs go to maybe 100 or 200 nits. That's a, I think that's one, uh, one candle power per square meter of light. The new screen technology they're talking about in the home, uh, they're looking at either going to 1,000 or 2,000 nits. So it's 10 or 20 times as bright as a regular TV. But what's important about it is that is the contrast range, right? So you still have very dark shadows and with detail in them and are very bright parts of the image. And as someone said, when you see a bright image come on an HDR screen, you have a, you have a physiological reaction. Your pupil, um, what's the opposite of dilates? It, it uh, shrinks. And so you feel that in your eyes. You feel a physical reaction to what's happening on the screen, which is something that we just haven't had before. We've had headaches from bad stereoscopic, but it's not quite the same thing. So I think this is absolutely the next step. Uh, it's relatively straightforward technology to implement. But then all of these things are. Ultimately, it comes down to whether you can, you know, by the time you've paid for the R&D, manufacturing the technology isn't that hard. The, uh, the question is, what do audiences really feel strongly about? And I'm with you. I think HDR is, is the next step. I think what will happen is we'll get HDR, we'll get these uh, better color gamuts, we'll get all of that. And I think the manufacturers will just sort of sneak in, oh, by the way, it's, it's UHD or, you know, it's 8K. It just will be. Uh, but that's years away. I think we're going to start to see uh, HDR media very, very soon. It was, uh, interrupt here, you brought up VR. I had a demo today, uh, earlier today in West LA, of uh, VR workflow. It was VR 10K workflow in post-production. You, well, you've, you've seen the, 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 the mounts where they have you know, several GoPros or several red cameras or whatever, and they're all shooting at the same time when they're actually yeah. filming entertainment for VR. And then you bring mm -hmm. them, ingest them into your, uh, your computer, and uh, I saw 10K workflow. And uh, of course you're not going to, to you're going to acquire maybe 10K, but you're not going to distribute 10K. It, but it was really interesting, and yes, we can do it. It, yep. was, it, was, it was incredible. I love it. You know, I was uh, speaking with Al Jazeera a while ago about their workflows, and they're, they're really interested in the idea of, of having, um, uh, you just get a pole with one. You can 3D print a GoPro rig. Yeah. It perfectly aligns them. Uh, that's cheap to do now. And you can hire GoPros for $20, $25 a day. You get a 14 camera rig. You can do it stereoscopic if you yes. want. Well, that takes some, some finishing. So you just plant one of these things in a location and you can have a reporter in the scene talking to the camera and walking around the camera <laughs> and saying, look right. over here and you can look over there. But and what they're saying is if you get it cheap enough, 
as the as the front line of a war zone moves, you can put a satellite transmitter in one of these, leave it behind, and run. <laughs> And as as the oh, that's brilliant. That's actually that's, that's that's absolutely brilliant. Yeah. Well, there's no reason, and you can get rigs. I think it's as few as if you want to go around, you can do it with something like four cameras is enough. If you want to go uh, a complete circle of image, but if you want a sphere, it's something like seven. And if you want to do it beautifully, it's uh, with stereoscopic, it's fourteen. But imagine if your experience of locations around the world is is VR like that. Now, I think that's, I think that is, it is happening and it is coming and we're working on the, the standardization right now. This, as usual with new technologies, there's 15 different competing yeah, technologies sure. we have to pick But one. do you think VR is going to be successful outside of games? Is the average viewer going to oh, want to put yes. on a headset to watch yes. it? Yes, I really do. If you look at HD, you know, that was driven by the PlayStation 2 supporting HD and suddenly there was demand for TV, so the price went down, or it went up and then it went down. Uh, I think I cannot. I'm a gamer, you know. I've been a gamer since Pong, and I, as they say, and I cannot wait to play. Goodness me! I mean, another Last of Us. Oh, the, the list is you know Far Cry. Far Cry uh, with a VR headset will be amazing. But I think that what that will do is pay for the standardization, pay for the reduction in price, pay for the conversion of this complex technology into a consumer technology. And then yeah, you know they're talking about two or three hundred dollars for a really great. VR headset. And, you know, yes, many people will have them in the home, but no, they won't use it for their general TV uh, consumption. They're going to use it for that, that one movie that's been shot especially for it, or location stuff. Or maybe it'll be... You know, or real estate, or architecture, or... I mean, it's, there's just an infinite amount of possibilities that's going to be used for, and you're going to see all of that at CES in uh, Las Vegas in January. And you know there's two ways of doing VR, right? You've got one way where you sit the camera in position and the viewer can look in every direction but they can't navigate. The other way, which is much more complex, is that you generate a 3D model of the environment, you acquire photo quality textures, put those in the 3D environment and allow the viewer, as it were, to navigate the environment. And what we're beginning to see now, particularly in the development of games, but this is something that we can work towards fairly quickly now with film and TV as well, is that you'll, in the games, you'll have, uh, effectively it's immersive theater. There'll be characters that'll be having a conversation, they'll be having a dialogue. You'll come across it as a player. And before you interact with these characters, you can just stand and watch sure. or ignore them or interact with them and change the narrative. And they're, now, they're, 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 the they're actually doing that right now. Uh, yep, they I, did it with, well, I, I just saw some of that just uh, last week at 20th Century Fox. So there's, they're, they're actually doing that, that kind of stuff. So. It's, uh... so we're doing that, but now what I want to see is I want to see the acquisition of dynamically generated 3D models of actors as they act in a set so that you, you generate a 3D model of the environment and that becomes the 3D space in which the user is navigating. And then you place the actors in that environment with, uh, with cameras in every direction uh, observing them taking that data, building it into a 3D model of the actors and placing them in the virtual space for the viewer. So that as a viewer, there could be an argument going on between two people in a room and you can walk around the room, stand next to them, go and stand somewhere else. You have an incredibly immersive experience. We have the technology for this, it's just difficult at the moment. Interesting. Maxim, where can people go on the web to learn more about the kind of projects and things you're working on? Well, I'm revamping my website, but maximjago.com is the, the place to go. Um, that's and, uh, that's, that's M-A-X-I-M-J-A-G-O, -M and Maxim sure. Jago himself is the face you're looking at. Maxim, thanks for joining us today. Thank you, Lance. A real pleasure. Thanks Take for having care. me. See thanks, you Maxim. Bye-bye. If you'd like to see more videos like this one, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. To stay connected and receive updates from The Buzz, sign up for our free weekly newsletter now. Or you can learn more about us on our website. And thanks for watching The Digital Production Buzz.